Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Are you ready for eternity? Can you face Jesus, the King of Kings, upon his return? Do you know the pathway to everlasting life? Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. Well, I'm tired and I'm weary, but I must move along till the Lord comes to call, call me away. Where the morning is bright and the lamb is the light and the night as the day there will be peace in the valley for me someday there will be peace in the valley for me oh Lord I pray there'll be no sadness no sorrow no trouble will I see there will be peace in the valley for me There the bear will be gentle And the wolf will be tame And the lion shall lay down by the lamb And the host from the wild Will be led by a child And I'll be changed from this creature that I am There will be peace in the valley For me someday There will be peace in the valley For me, oh Lord, I pray There'll be no sadness no sorrow, no trouble will I see. There will be peace in the valley for me. Well, we greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our wonderful Redeemer. And... Uh, uh, today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to start off by just talking to you for a few minutes and we want to share some things with you and ask you a couple of questions. And uh, as I start, I want you to know that I realize that many of you that will listen to this uh, uh, already know very well what I'm talking about and have experienced uh, the great things that God has for you. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about some things that uh, perhaps those who have never made a, a decision or even really know about the things uh, that uh, has been prepared for them and the wonderful privileges that they have uh, as they serve the Lord. And I think there are probably many that may listen and that uh, uh, don't even recognize that there's an opportunity for them to have a change within their lifestyle. So I'm going to just offer a brief word of prayer, and then I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and we'll get into the study. So let's just pray, shall we? 
Heavenly Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask you to anoint this message, this study, and anoint those who watch and hear, and give us a time of uh, great uh, uh, understanding and knowledge and the great promises of God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to take you to the book of Romans, chapter number 5. You can be looking that up. I'm going to be, of course, reading from the King James Version because, uh, number one, that's the one I know best. And uh, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. What if you were born with a terrible disease and you were told there's no cure for it, there's nothing that can be done, it's going to be life-shortening, it's going to be a painful and a, and a terrible way of life. It's not going to be anything that you can possibly enjoy, but you're stuck with it. And there's nothing you can do about it, you're told. And then suddenly there is an answer that just changes the whole picture. And it's a, an answer that can change the condition of uh, your body with which you were born. Uh, your spirit with which you were born. It can change your whole life, your whole lifestyle, and it can change your destiny for eternity. And uh, yet, uh, no one would tell you about it. You didn't hear about it. You lived your life, uh, and what if uh, you went on into eternity without knowing that you spent that whole lifetime in the bondage of that infirmity that was holding you back and keeping you from really enjoying the fullness of life. You'd be pretty upset, wouldn't you? I would think so. And then another question. What if, and it's a what if, you were born, and you know, when I was growing up and people were born into a wealthy family or family that was uh, uh, well equipped with life and had no problem with money and so forth, it was said they were born with a silver spoon. Now what does that mean? Well, the idea was they don't have anything to worry about in life. They've got it all. They were born into a family that has everything. They're wealthy. They're uh, high up in society. They're well recognized in the community. Uh, they're just a very nice uh, uh, family and, and they were privileged to be born into that family. But then were they? What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, you know, there are things in life that money can't buy. And there are situations in life that money cannot fix. And there are opportunities in life that money cannot help with. Oh, come on now. What are you talking about? I'm talking about something that is more important to you than anything in the entire world. And that's a, what if there was a place you could have eternal life. You could walk in this world in the knowledge that you had Almighty uh, God and a great and beautiful gift uh, extended to you that you could take a part of and receive unto yourself. And what if nobody told you about it? Or what if they told you about it and you sort of heard about it, but you didn't do any investigation to see what it was all about? I'm going to talk about those kinds of things today. And we may ask you another question or two, what if, as we go along. But for right now, let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 1. And I want to start off with the first verse. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I've noticed one thing in this world. Now, I've noticed something about this world, everybody I've ever met. Uh, has always wanted one specific thing. They wanted peace. They wanted to be able to enjoy life in tranquility. They wanted to be able to uh, have a sense of, of uh, covering and protection and no worries about uh, situations that might come their way. What if that was your privilege but you didn't know anything about it? Well, the first thing I want to say to you is that the promise of God in the very first chapter of Romans 5 
says, and I read it before, but I'm going to read it again. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's no peace that you could possibly come by that is greater or nearly as great as the peace that God gives unto you. Because the peace that God gives unto you is a peace that no matter what comes your way, having faith in God and His power and His ability, having faith in God that uh, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, uh, has a gift for you that He bought and paid for a long time ago because God the Father loved you and didn't want to see you trapped in that place of agony and worry and care and all kinds of difficulties and situations that are beyond comprehension to our carnal mind today. And because we don't know what tomorrow's going to hold, we know a little bit about what yesterday held. It wasn't too great, was it? When you didn't serve the Lord, it certainly wasn't. But I want to tell you a little bit about God's promise and God's gift to you and it doesn't cost you anything except believing and having faith that, that uh, the Word of God, the Heavenly Father, is true to His Word and He has made a way for you to come from a place of terrible a birth, a, a right, and, and, and birth a situation wherein you were born into this world with a, a, a dead spirit, an incapable spirit to understand and, and to uh, walk in righteousness, where the spirit that you were born with was a spirit that was of carnality and corruption and uh, disease and infirmity, and I'm not talking about just physical disease, I'm talking about spiritual disease. Those kinds of things that not only hinder you in the flesh, but they steal from you the relationship and the beauty and the glory of Almighty God's promise through our Lord Jesus Christ to give unto you a righteous spirit and an eternal existence for the ages to come as you walk before the Lord in that spirit that you're given upon your coming to the point of faith and of believing and accepting what Jesus had to offer for you. Well, you say, Pastor, what did he have to offer? I don't know of anything that he had to offer me. Oh, you don't, huh? Well, let's see about that. How would you like to live forever? How would you like to live without any fear of judgment in eternity? How would you like to live in a situation where when danger, trouble, disappointment, heartache, uh, physical difficulties, financial difficulties that uh, uh, come your way in this life? Uh, how would you like to live in a situation where because Jesus paid the price that you might have eternal life, he also paid the price uh, that he, through the Heavenly Father and the Word of God, caused you to have wisdom and knowledge and beyond understanding of the carnal mind, and walk in a realm wherein you had quiet peace and confidence that no matter what came your way, God was going to give you the ability to deal with it, to see you through it, to come to you in an hour of trouble, uh, to sustain you in an hour of weakness or fear, to protect you from the uh, powers of darkness that would rob and steal and and cheat you out of your very life itself, and uh, you didn't know about it, or you didn't have the opportunity to learn about it, and uh, it came and went, and you didn't even pay any attention to the great gift that God has for you. Well, I want to talk about that. You see, it doesn't cost you anything but faith. Well, what's faith? Faith is... Seeing a situation, learning of a situation, and knowing its truth, that then you respond to that truth and you take advantage of that truth with the faith that even though you may not be able to see it and touch it with your fingers or put it in your pocketbook or swallow it into your stomach, 
It is a kind of a thing that is so sustaining and uh, powerful and wonderful and supernatural that is given unto those who will have faith and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father. So, therefore, being justified by faith. What does it mean to be justified? It means that in spite of the fact that you live in sin, you are corrupt, you haven't uh, uh, had your spirit revitalized and, and made new by the uh, work of the Lord Jesus Christ that he paid for you at the cross of Calvary. You've not accepted any of that. And, and uh, now all at once you come to the knowledge of what happened and you realize that uh, the Bible says and the Heavenly Father declares that, that uh, uh, he will uh, keep his word and that whatever he declares is true and as you believe him those who believe now no 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 not everybody comes to the Lord Jesus Christ not everybody will come by their own choice not everybody will understand and listen and take advantage of the opportunity because of their greed and their carnal attitudes and their ungodly thoughts and their uh, immoral activities and, and all of that that comes our way in this old carnal flesh of ours and our carnal mind. God says he will change that. Well, let's go to verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into his grace, that's God the Father's grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Oh, the promise of God, the glory of God, the gift of God is about to be unfurled unto our understanding. What is it? Well, the first thing it is is that uh, we have access to it by faith that we received when we believed we could have the peace of God and the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, talked about in verse 1. So into his grace wherein we stand. Now our faith has taken us into a place of grace. Well, what's grace? Grace is uh, ignoring or changing or hard to describe perhaps, but... Uh, it's the kind of thing that you have a superior power and authority over you that is able to extend unto you uh, forgiveness and that can take that kind of life that you've been living and uh, extend to you the privilege of uh, wiping the slate clean and giving you a brand new beginning and letting you start over in your life uh, in your spirit and, and remember that what we do uh, God said out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and you see uh, whatever is in your spirit your heart not talking about the thump 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 of the heartbeat in your physical body is talking about that uh, inner spirit that you were born with and you were born with uh, an inner spirit that was dead had no life had no ability to walk in righteousness had no ability to uh, do what you really wanted to do and knew you ought to do but you always ended up failing and doing something that wasn't so good and uh, uh, it was a situation where uh, you were born crippled. You were born with an infirmity. You were born with a situation uh, that you could not help yourself. And you inherited it from your forebearers. Yeah, through Adam. Adam failed God, sinned. And he who had all the knowledge and the ability to rule and govern the whole earth that God had put him in charge of turned his back on God and believed the devil, who the Bible says is a liar, was a liar from the beginning, be a liar to the end, and there's no truth in him. He cannot speak the truth. And so we serve him by default. And by default, I mean, uh, it was a predestined situation that we were born into because Adam had no ability once he sinned and rebelled against God. Uh, he died spiritually. He had no ability to pass on to his descendants 
those things that God had given unto him out of the purity and the holiness and the righteousness of, of God's creation of Adam and Eve as he said he would make man in his own image. Well, he did. And man soon rejected God's image and turned to the ways and the lies of darkness through the power of satanic lies and deceit. Verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Oh, now wait a minute. I thought you said we were going to have an easy life, a peaceful life, a, a life of a, a surety and certainty that everything was going to turn out good in the long run. That's what I said. And that's what I stand by, so maybe I should explain a couple of things. It tells us that not only do we have the privilege that we can, that we can have the grace of God, wherein we walk and live on a daily basis, it's always there with us once we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, the gift of God that he gave unto us, that he paid the debt for our sin and our ungodliness, and even had the power to give unto us a, a renewed spirit and a recreated spirit in our body that we could not receive from our carnal, natural father, but we could receive as the free gift of God because we believed that God loved us enough and cared enough about us and, and cared enough about us that he made a way where we could be set free from a law, a bondage, an infirmity, if you please, that always led to eternal death and damnation and judgment. Nothing in it was good. And I've often said, as probably some of you have heard me, if you've listened for a while, I've often said, uh, you know, we live in a situation where we had no choice about the spirit that was within us when we were born. But God, seeing the condition we were in, made a way where he could change that for us if we would, what, have faith? walk in faith and with the peace of God, and whom we could come to God, oh, we could come into His grace, His grace and mercy, His ability to wipe our guilt and condemnation and failures and, and all the things that we are and, and, and did uh, as we walked in the carnal nature of the old uh, enemy of our soul, uh, and uh, we find ourselves in a situation of the kind of bondage that the Bible tells us is the law of sin and death, uh, speaking of eternal death and damnation. And so the grace of God is ours. Verse 3 says, and we can glory in the tribulations. Oh, come on now, Pastor. What about, oh, what, I, the tribulation is a long way off yet. I wish I could tell you that's true. But it isn't. Tribulation is, the great tribulation is a lot closer than what many people think. And according to the signs of the times and the prophets of, of old and the New Testament, we have to come to the conclusion that the events that are going on in our world today are the precursor, uh, the foundation being laid uh, for that uh, uh, great tribulation that's coming. That's not what this is talking about. This word tribulation means tests and trials and difficulty. Well, we all have those, do we not? You think, well, I've got this all planned out and it's going to go just like I planned it. And you get right to the edge of it. And you begin to uh, exert the effort it takes to obtain whatever it was you were after. And boom! It evaporates before your eyes. It falls apart. What you strived for, and you was ready to reach for, it wasn't there. It was gone. God is not that kind of a God. When we come to God, we can find something that's very important. 
He gives us the ability to glory means to have exceeding joy and happiness and fulfillment in whatever situation we're confronted with. When you say, well, why should I glory in troubles and trials and difficulties that you say tribulation represents? Well, let's look at it. Knowing that those tests and trials and difficulties that we face, what does it do? Well, it works patience. Now, I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, you know, I have a terrible problem with patience. Well, I, I, I don't have much trouble with patience, but I sure have a terrible problem with impatience. Impatience. Uh, I, I'm not a very patient person. It always gets me in trouble. That's what they're saying. So, would you pray that God would give me patience? Well, now, what are we praying for here? See, when they come, they're saying, I just want to be free from all this chaos and stuff that I've created in my own decisions, my own life, and, and circumstances, and judgments, and decisions that I've made that have not been very good ones. And, and uh, I, I, I'm very impatient, I get upset, have a terrible time of trouble uh, with uh, anger, and uh, get angry, and I do things I shouldn't do, say things I didn't really mean, but I did, I guess. You get down really to it, because again, what's inside comes out through your speech. So, you want me to pray for you to receive patience. Well, here's the key to that. Receiving patience comes through walking through the tests and trials and difficulties that this life brings against us and let it be guided and directed and strengthened and, and uh, concluded by the help of God as we go through each trial, each difficulty. And what does that do? Well, the Bible says that's what works patience. So if you ask for me to pray for your patience, you're asking me to pray that you'll have great tribulation, more tribulation than you've already got. Because when you learn to get through that, you receive patience. It builds patience. It teaches patience. It brings self-control. It brings a higher standard than what you've been living. It causes you to be able to have a freedom from the bondage of the guilty conscience and, and the feelings and knowledge of failures and the terrible situations that you wish you could do over again and, and, and not be a participant in and all of that. And see, and so tribulation works patience. Now, let's go on into verse 4. What does it say? Well, and patience, experience. Oh, my goodness. Patience works experience. Now, what could that possibly mean? Well, when you go through the rough times, you're supposed to learn something from them. And you're supposed to recognize that uh, you need God's help. And as you walk in the peace and the knowledge and the faith and the grace and the mercy of God, and your impatience begins to well up, you come to the place where you have to begin to exercise some self-discipline. You have to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to stop it right here. Now, why do you do that? Because the experience of the last thing you went through should have taught you, I hope it did teach you, that, hey, it's not worth it. Let it go. Get through it walk in the righteousness of the Lord that He's enabled you to walk in by His grace, His mercy, His love, and indeed His redemptive work on the cross of Calvary, and learn from it. And so patience is developed 
And when patience comes, uh, that brings experience. Actually, we could probably reverse that thought a little bit. Experience develops patience. And patience recognizes and brings forth the experience which is always an element of the present or the past. Experience is never an element of the future. It's an element of the present or the past. And so I've come this far. I know what God has done. I know what I have done. I know what God has promised he would do for me. I know what my gift is from Almighty God the Father and my Lord and Redeemer Savior, Jesus the Christ. And I have the experience now and I'm going to stand in that experience and I'm not going to yield to the old carnal nature of this flesh of mine and I'm going to overrule it. And what's the next thing I get? Oh my goodness, look at this. And experience brings hope. Well, what's the difference between hope and faith? Well, hope is pleasurable anticipation. It is looking at the promise, getting exciting about what's coming, how many of you remember, maybe some of you didn't have this privilege, but how many of you remember when there was a, a special day that came along and, and uh, uh, you had been promised that now when, uh, when you get to this point, you're going to receive a certain gift from me. For instance, uh, you're a teenager, you're going through school, you finally get through uh, junior high and then you get into uh, senior high and you, you come to the place where you're now going to graduate and uh, uh, the folks don't have a lot of money. Uh, they don't have much they can do in a monetary way. Uh, but down through the years, because they looked forward to, they had faith that you were going to graduate, uh, they began to lay some aside and, uh, and uh, they said, okay, now if you uh, are faithful in school, you get decent grades, you graduate, and you have a decent record on your certificate of graduation, we're going to give you a new car. Now, you're in a situation where you can have faith that they mean what they say and they will do it, but hope adds to that faith and it causes you to be terribly excited. And the closer you get to graduation, and when you can bring that diploma home and show mom and dad, uh, or mom or dad, whichever the case may be, and you show them your credentials, and you say, hey, I graduated like you said I should, and I promised I would, and now here I am, and uh, you're all excited, and hope is pleasurable expectation. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but uh, not a good illustration maybe, but sometimes uh, our pleasurable expectation gets crushed. Why? Because somewhere along the line, either we failed or the one who promised failed. But you see, when God promises, he never fails. He never goes back on his word. When he speaks something, when he declares something, when he uh, says uh, and, and does a work in your life, uh, it is done. It is sealed. It is there. It cannot, will not be reversed unless you, by rebellion and rejection of what God has done for you, reject it and turn your back upon God. But if you don't, you can have exciting hope, pleasurable anticipation. And what does that do? Well, let's look at verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. Oh my! What does hope do? It's a motivator. It is a, 
a, a, an establishment of expectation. It is a, a formulating a vision of that which is to come. It is something that uh, uh, is uh, motivating in such a measure that it energizes us and, and causes us to, to walk in great and wonderful anticipation of what lies ahead. And it says, and hope maketh not ashamed. Well, uh, what it's saying is, if you have true hope and you're walking the pleasure of that hope in the Lord, now people will fail you, yes. But God will never fail you. You may fail God, but God won't fail you. And so you can walk in the hope and the anticipation of every promise that you read in the Word of God, that you hear spoken to you by witness and testimony of what God has done for others, and even what God has done and will do for you. And you can walk in that space of hope and anticipation with such joy that it motivates you, and it causes energy to flow within you, it causes discipline to be firm in you. It brings faith to a point of, of a, a growth and a establishment of, of action in the things that God has promised. And it motivates you to walk that straight and narrow path that the Lord Jesus Christ said to us is the straight and the narrow way that leads to life eternal. Now, I don't know of anybody that really, if they have any hope about life, any appreciation of life that they live here on this earth, most people want to live on after this earth. One of the great questions that I have come to me, and I think it comes to everybody who is a Christian, how do you know that there is an afterlife? Well, God says there is. Jesus proved it. He rose from the dead. He says because he rose from the dead, we can rise from the dead and will rise from the dead when he returns to take us unto himself as joint heirs with him and the heirs of God and all the privileges and blessings and purity and abundance and hope and, and everything that's wonderful and good about life itself will be ours because we had hope and we had faith. Hope maketh not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Well, how do I know I have eternal life? How do I know I have a new spirit within when I actually accept Jesus Christ and follow through with what uh, uh, we were instructed in the Word to do and water baptism and repentance and remission uh, for the remission of sin and so forth? What, what about all of that? It tells us that when we have had the creation of a, a new spirit within, then we have the presence of the righteousness of Jesus Christ within our spirit was never there before. We can read the Bible. It has some meaning to it now. It's a situation where we can anticipate and enjoy the future and uh, look forward to that wonderful day when all of the corruption around about us and all of the opposition we face in this world because we dare to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father uh, is over. It's gone. It's done. And we're going to live forever with Him. And no, we're not going to be in heaven. We're going to be in a new earth. It's going to be a new heaven. And the Bible says that that there's going to be a new Jerusalem that comes down and it's between the new heaven and the new earth and there's no need of the sun or the moon. It will light all of the creation of God because the new city Jerusalem will be filled with the radiation and the illumination of the brilliance of of righteousness and holiness that God the Father is, always was, and always will be. And because we have accepted His cure for the terrible disease that we inherited, that dead spirit, as a result of the old devil and Adam's failure, we conquered it because we had 
faith, we had hope, we had grace, we had mercy, and we had the promise of God. And then we had the addition of the Holy Spirit, the righteous spirit of Jesus Christ within us. And we can choose to either live by the standard of Christ. Oh, you say, Pastor, I don't do that very good. Well, you can. And uh, the reason you don't do it very good is because you are allowing the carnal nature of the flesh, which God was honest and told us you're going to live in that in that uh, a putrid flesh of yours uh, until uh, I take you out of this world. And when I take you out of this world, if you've served me, you're going to be with me. Now, so what does that do? It means that we had ought to be constantly realizing that the war that goes on within us is a spiritual war. It is a spirit of righteousness telling us, don't take that path, don't do that thing, don't walk in that situation, don't make that decision. And the old flesh is saying, oh, but look how pretty it looks. Oh, but look what a wonderful exhilaration it's going to be to my flesh. Oh, it's going to be fun, 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 fun. Let me tell you something. There is no such thing as fun. Because fun is an image that is resting in unholiness. Pleasure is pure, exciting, anticipation and hope, motivation, strength, comfort. All the things that we can put with it uh, are innumerable. And pleasure is real. Fun is a figment of the imagination and it lasts maybe as long as the activity does. In many instances, fun turns into terrible, terrible things before the fun has ever concluded. And it's brought to conclusion by disaster or tragedy or all kinds of things that may come against you. Experience is important. Patience is important. Hope is important. And if we have hope, we're not ever going to be ashamed of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. They can do what they want, they can say what they want, they can laugh, they can mock, they can persecute, they can uh, uh, even kill and, and slaughter, but no matter what they do that hate the Lord Jesus Christ, whose spirit is within us, no matter what they do, they can't kill us. Because you see, the spirit of righteousness has recreated within our spirit eternal life as long as we keep it faithfully until the Bible says the end. And I've told you many times the end can be a multitude of things. A lot of people say, well, the end is when the Lord comes back for us. But for every one of us, the end comes when we breathe our last breath on this earth. It's over. And wherever we are in that moment is where we're going to spend eternity in the future. Not a pretty sight unless you have experienced the grace of God, the mercy of God, the experience of faith and hope, promise of God's Word, power of His Spirit, the abundance of His promises, and all of those things that He adds unto us day by day as we serve Him. Well, Pastor, I, I've been told that if you serve Jesus, it's, you're not going to have any of those problems. Well, that's another lie from Satan. Well, I want you to know a good Christian told me that. Well, that good Christian is either a messenger of Satan or they are ignorant because they have believed a lie that comes from Satan. If you're going to serve the Lord Jesus Christ while you're in this old carnal body, you're going to face difficulties and persecution and some, the Bible tells us, will even have to give their life because it's either deny Christ 
which use everything that you believe for, or you're going to have to say, no, I will not deny him, and somebody's going to take your life. It could happen to you, it could happen to me. But you see, that doesn't mean anything, because to be released from this body, the spirit that is within us cannot be destroyed, unless we destroy it. Think on that. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, I've been talking about that. I've been telling you that when he went to the cross, he paid the debt for our sins, and he broke the bondage and the chains of, of the law of sin and death of, uh, from our spirit, and he created within us a new spirit, and praise God, we have the promise that when we were without strength, God intervened. For scarcely, verse 7, for a righteous man will one die. Yet, for adventure, for a good man, some would even dare to die. But, go on to verse number 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to reform ourselves. That was impossible. He didn't wait for us to come to the place that uh, we just uh, uh, shut ourselves away and, and uh, refused to face life and, and lived a life of uh, isolation unto ourselves to escape all the stuff that we thought we might have to face. He's not talking about that. What's he talking about? God commendeth, God extended, is the word that commendeth means in the original, English meaning extended, his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. He didn't wait for us to make the decision. He said, I'm going to die for everyone who will believe upon me. Who will believe upon my only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. Who will believe that Jesus died for their sin. And so, he died for all who will believe, but all who hear this message will not believe because they'd rather live in the corruption of this world than they would to live in the eternal and glorious, uh, wonderful, perfect presence of God throughout all eternity. It's not a good exchange, folks. It's time to get rid of the carnal flesh and the nature of the flesh having its way. Walk close enough to God to keep fed in the Word of God. The Bible says that Jesus is, uh, is the Word, and Jesus says that He's the bread and the water of life. And so if we feast upon the Word of God, if we take it in, if we live by it, if we let it become a part of our spirit, our spirit is continually renewed, and we walk in the strength and the ability of the Holy Spirit, and we are not going to be one of those who knew we could come to the Lord, but would rather live in the stench and the, and the degradation and the filth of sin. So, Jesus died for us, and he left it up to us to make the decision with what we were going to do with the gift he gave unto us as he gave his very blood on the cross of Calvary to set us free from the law of sin and death. Verse 9, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. Now, what does that mean? Being justified. Being considered innocent when we're guilty. The price was paid to buy us from the jaws of death and damnation. And if we will take the gift and live it for God, we have what? We shall be delivered, saved from wrath through him. You see, the day's coming when the wrath of God is going to fall upon the ungodly. And we don't want to be one of those who find ourselves at the hand of God's wrath. 
much better to be at the hand of God's mercy and grace and love and long-suffering and patience with us. For verse 10, I'm going to have to end here because uh, it's about time for us to go into communion here. But let's go to verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now let's look at that carefully. We were enemies to God. Why were we enemies? Because we were born with a spirit that was the enemy of God. It was not God's spirit. It was a spirit of ungodliness. It was really from the forces and the powers of Satan's lies. We were reconciled. What does that mean? It means that because we have been justified, we have been delivered from wrath, so that before we were justified, we were enemies. But now that we are justified, we are reconciled, acceptable to God by the death of His Son. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You see, the person who has been born again into the kingdom of God, had that change, that recreation of their spirit. All things become new when that Spirit of God comes within us as we are converted and accept Him as Lord and Redeemer and Savior. And so, we find ourselves now in a place where the body can die, it will die, the Bible says it's sure to die, unless we happen to be alive when he comes back for his bride. And if we do, then we'll be caught up to be with him. And wherever he is, we'll be with him for the ages. And I've talked about that in other studies. And so I'm going to end it there with the declaration that uh, we are acceptable to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life. The Bible tells us because he rose from the dead, we too will rise from the dead in due time. And with that, beloved, it's time for us to change the thought. I'll finish this study in this chapter uh, perhaps next week, perhaps at another time as the Lord leads. But right now we're going to take a little break and we're going to go to communion, and I hope that you will receive communion with us. Let's go, if we might, to the book of Luke, I believe. Yes, Luke number 22. And we'll begin reading with verse 14. Jesus had sent his disciples on into Jerusalem to prepare a place for the Passover dinner. It would be the last Passover dinner that he would eat in celebration of the Passover uh, in which he was involved in passing through Egypt and the firstborn of every creature died on that night. But he passed over the children of Israel, the chosen of God. The ones that God said, I created in my image. And what did he say? In Isaac and Jacob shall my seed be. So all of that is there. And so now we're in a situation where he's come to pay the price that God had forecast through the prophets of old that would come. Now old Israel didn't really understand all of that. But I'm confident that even though they didn't understand, when he did come, he paid the price for them just as he has for us. And so in verse 14 it says these words. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, 
With desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. See, he'd already told him he was going to suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this, divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is a New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And that's the great gift, the great present that is ours, that is greater than any gift that could ever be received by any, any creature upon the face of the earth or in the heavens. It is the gift of eternal life in the purity and holiness of Almighty God through Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who died for us. Praise His name. Now, Father, if there's anything in our life that is not right, we ask You to cleanse us, to forgive us, to remove it from us. And, Lord, we turn our back upon it and we ask forgiveness and cleansing as we take of communion, Lord, because we don't want any blemish on our life when we come into Your holy, righteous presence. And so, let us eat of the bread. Praise His name. Represents His broken body. Let us eat together. Now, after the bread was broken, He took the cup. It was filled with grape juice. It was grape wine, no doubt because he didn't have refrigeration in those days. And so, don't split hairs over its condition. Just remember that it represented the shed blood of the Lord that poured into the ground to separate you from death eternal and give you life eternal because Jesus bought your redemption back from the powers of of the law of sin and death. Let us drink together. Praise His wonderful name. Thank you, Father. Well, we've got some wonderful things to tell you next week. And I think we'll uh, continue in the lesson. We get into some new thoughts in that chapter. And I hope they'll be exciting and helpful for you. God bless you, and I hope you'll return next week. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at Christian Living 101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona, 85050. Or email Gene at Gene with a G-E-N-E, Gene at ChristianLiving101.org.